Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to You and we come to Your Word. As You are holy, 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 may we see Your Word today as perfect, as without error, as effective in our lives, Lord. Today as we come to Your Word, open our hearts for correction. Open our minds for encouragement. And may we come humbly to You as we worship You through learning of Your Word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So we have been in Hebrews, as we all know, as we've been here for a while. and uh, We come today to the third warning in the book of Hebrews. So as we've gone through the book of Hebrews, we see this rhythm that the author has. The author teaches something, teaches some ideas, teaches some, some truth, teaches some things, corrects some things. We'll then go into the Old Testament to validate those or bring those forward, to tie those together. And then he will break away and he will warn the people of something that's going on. The first warning came after the first chapter. The author detailed the work and the place of Christ. In the first chapter, he taught that God taught through the author that, that Christ is appointed as the heir of all. He is the creator of the entire universe. He is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of God's nature. He sustains all things by His powerful word and He is the final mediator by making purifications for the sins. And He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, taking the highest place of authority. And it said that God speaks now through His Son. As the author developed this and, and brought this forward, in the beginning of chapter 2, he gives the first warning. He says, For this reason, we must pay attention. All the more to what we have heard, so that we will not drift away. For if the message spoken through the angels was legally binding, and every transgression and disobedience received a just punishment, how will we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? This salvation had its beginning when it was spoken of by the Lord, and it was confirmed to us by those who heard Him. At the same time, God also testified by signs and wonders, various miracles and distributions of gifts from the Holy Spirit according to His will. See, the first met warning was not to neglect the message, the message of the Gospel. He calls them to pay attention, to focus intently on who Jesus is, and what He has done so that they will not drift by the message. The message of the good news of Jesus. In that section, He tells them to remember who Jesus is. And if that's not enough, remember that there's consequences for rebellion and disobedience to God. And then if that's not enough, He says, look at all of the signs and wonders that God has given to testify to the truth that Jesus' message is from God. He gives these three things to pay attention to, to focus on. The author would continue after that warning to speak of Jesus' humanity, of what has accomplished and what his, that His humanity has destroyed, the one holding the power of death, and that is the devil. And through His humanity and through His incarnation, through His time in the flesh on this earth, He would be able to become the merciful and faithful high priest. That he would be the atoning sacrifice for the people's sins. He would then compare the greatness of Moses to the greatness of Jesus. Not that Moses was brought down, but that Jesus was higher. In every way that Moses was faithful, Jesus was greater than that. And after he teaches that, he comes to the second warning. The first one was pay attention the second one says, watch out, brothers and sisters, so that there won't be any of you in an evil, any of, in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage each other daily, while it is still called today, so that none of you is hardened by sin's deception. For we have become participants in Christ if we hold firmly until the end, until the end of the reality that we had at the start. See, he tells them to pay attention. Then he tells them to watch out. 
And then he continues. You can just see that he's, he's emphasizing the fact that people need to wake up, that they're not focusing on the right things, that they're going to miss out. And what we started last week was he transitioned into from all of that into Jesus as the high priest. And he went into that last week, as the last couple weeks as we started that conversation. And we'll just read that so we remember where we were at as we ended in, in Hebrews 5, 7-10. through 10. It says, During his earthly life, he offered prayers and appeals with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was the son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. After he was perfected, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. And he was declared a God by the high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, I must say, I've already been talking to you about how I pronounce Melchizedek. Uh, that's a struggle for me. Uh, I have an email address that has the word Kai in the middle of it, and I've had it for 23 years. And so I default to that. So it's Melchizedek, and uh, I'm not really good with English, so you'll have to forgive me on that as an engineer. But as the author spoke of this, he brought forth this idea that Jesus was going to be, even though he met all of the qualifications and was brought forth qualified and appointed by God to be the high priest, that he would come from a different order. He wouldn't come in the order of the Levitical priesthood to oversee that. He would come in the order of Melchizedek. And we will see that for the next couple chapters, the author is going to dive into this and defend this and develop this throughout the next couple chapters. However, he has to take a segue. He comes to the third warning. And he has to pause. And before we get into the next three weeks, I have to say that, that the, the next three weeks are, are one set of thoughts. It's one paragraph that talks about this warning. And they are the most heavily disputed uh, sections of Scripture that I have come across yet in what people believe they say. As we get into it, we will see, um, or as I continue to study it, what we find is that throughout all of the time that people have been studying Hebrews, there are difference of opinions on what God was saying, what God was communicating. Because my goal here is, is to not to teach you what I think. That's the last thing I want you to know. I want to do my best to present what God said by what he interpreted. What was he saying to the original audience? And the hard part with the next three weeks is that it is really hard to come to a definitive, concrete answer to the interpretation and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to present some of the ideas the two most likely ones there are no less than five different ideas major ideas floating with the context of the next three weeks some of them just get thrown out right off the bat because some of them have some different doctrines in them that we don't believe in and they go out. But the, between the, the major differences and then the many sub-variations of it, it's going to take a little bit, and I'm trying to be very careful with these, to go through because these are verses that are very easy for us to read ourselves into, to put our context in, to put our preconceived notions in. And so we're going to look at these um, in fair detail, and like I said, I'm going to present the two most uh, common interpretations. And the reason these interpretations stand time is because both of them can be defended with other Scripture. So neither of these necessarily are wrong. They don't conflict other interpretation, but because of the way the words translate, because of some of the vagueness, because of the culture shifts, between Jewish people and Christianity, there's just a lot of debate on the specifics of this. This week we won't have to deal with the hard um, disagreements. Next week will be the one where we deal with a lot of hard interpretations of people coming to different conclusions about different things. And so I'm going to read the whole passage today, and we're going to focus on the first four verses. And it says that we have a great deal to say about this. Speaking back to the new order as Jesus' high priest. He says, we have a great deal to say about this. 
And it is difficult to explain since you have become too lazy to understand. Although by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the basic principles of God's revelation again. You need milk, not solid food. Now everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced with the message about righteousness because he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, for those whose senses have been trained to distinguish between good and evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teaching about Christ and go on to a maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works, faith in God, teaching about ritual washings, laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And we will do this if God permits. For it is impossible to renew to repentance those who were once enlightened, who tasted the heavenly gift, who shared in the Holy Spirit, who tasted God's good word and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away. This is because to their own harm they are re-crucifying the Son of God and holding Him up to contempt. For the ground that drinks the rain that often falls on it and that produces vegetation useful to those for whom it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it produces thorns and thistles, it is worthless and about to be cursed and at the end will be burned. Even though we are speaking this way, dearly loved friends, in your case we are confident of things that are better and that pertain to salvation. For God is not unjust, He will not forget your work and the love you demonstrated for his name by serving the saints and by continuing to serve them. Now we desire each of you to demonstrate the same diligence for the full assurance of your hope until the end so that you won't become lazy but will be imitators of those who inherit the promises through faith and perseverance. A lot in there. You can already see there's a lot of things that can be taken different ways. So we're going to look at the first part of this warning today. And the first part of this warning is about immaturity. See, he has just claimed that Christ has been declared by God as the high priest, a high priest of the order of Melchizedek. But before he can dive into this topic anymore, he says he has to stop and he has to address what is hindering their ability to learn about this. So we go back to Hebrews 5.11. We have, be, we have a great deal to say about this. And it is difficult to explain since you have become too lazy to understand. It's very, very direct. Too lazy to understand. He says that he has much to explain. They have much to present. But what I'm about to explain, he says... It, it's not difficult to teach you. However, there is an issue. It's difficult to explain because you have become lazy to understand. The ESV, I'll read a lot of ESV in here. Once again, this kind of shows how these words get translated uh, a lot in, into a lot of different English words depending on which translation you're in. And I think comparing the CSB and the ESV are helpful in this. So, reading this in the ESV, it says, About this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. Dull of hearing. It literally means slow and sluggish hearing. As information has been taught, as the teachings of God have been brought forward, They have come to a point where they are slow or sluggish to hear what is being given. We might say something like, how many of you have husbands that you claim that the information you tell them goes in one ear and out the other? It doesn't stick or it doesn't land. Or I have to repeat myself over and over and over again. Are you listening? Right? Have we ever experienced people in our lives I see a lot of women smiling and nodding right now and a lot of guys shaking their head because it's true. But what he's saying is that they have become dull of hearing. It goes in one ear and out the other. I coach uh, young boys soccer. I have a team of 10-year-olds now. It's always fun when you teach young boys because they already know everything. 
Just this weekend, we go out there and we tell a young boy, say, this is what we're doing today. He goes, yeah, I know. And I'm like, how in the world do you know? I have never told you this before. We have never done this before. In the history of the world, you have never heard what I just told you because we literally just created it. Yeah, I know. No, you don't know. Yes, I do. With young boys, we expect those type of answers. With the immature and the young, we expect them to have these quick responses or these immature reactions. The other one that's always fun is when you talk to them and you, you teach them something and you look them right in the face and they're looking you in the eyes and you're like, do you understand what I just taught you? Yes! And they run out and do the exact opposite of what you just said. And you're like, you're not hearing a single word that I am saying. Well, that's kind of what the author is saying about the church here. About the people that he's speaking to. They have become sluggish to hear. Now, if we take what's normal for 10-year-old boys and we apply it to adults, how does that work? It doesn't work, does it? If we act in the same way. Well, he's using this very vivid picture to say, this is what is going on with some of you people. There are instructions, and they are clear, but they're not sticking. It doesn't land. And that this is something that these people have become, which means at one point in time, they were not slow to hear. They were quick to hear. They had gained this enlightenment, or they had understood this stuff, but over time, they have become dull in hearing. They have grown this way. They have gone backwards. The author will then take what the consequences are of this sluggish hearing. Lazy to understand. And he uses this very vivid baby picture. Going to Hebrews 5.12. Lack of growing. Although by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the basic principles of God's revelation again. You need milk not solid food. See, in their dullness of hearing and their sluggishness, they allow and they sit and allow this information to come and go. The things that are taught just pass on by. The information that's presented is not there anymore. There isn't any growth with what is being taught. He says they should be able to teach by this time. As we've looked at the time period of this, it is expected this is after the church had been around for a little bit. And so they would have heard and taught many things. And he is claiming that this group should be able to teach. But they can't. They're unable to do so. Now, the Bible does speak of an office of teaching. There are some people that God sets aside for specific teaching at specific levels. However, it also doesn't exempt anyone from teaching. And I'll use Deuteronomy 6, 1-9 through 9 as an example. This is the command, the statutes and ordinances, the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you, so you may follow them in the land you are about to enter and possess. Do this that you may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life by keeping all of his statutes and commands I am giving you, your son and your grandson, so that you may have a long life. Listen, Israel, and be careful to follow them so that you may prosper and multiply greatly because the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has promised you a land flowing with milk and honey. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. These words that I am giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your city gates. That's teaching. 
As we look at the Word of God, as we look at the role of the family, as we look at what husbands and wives and mothers and fathers are supposed to do, none of us are exempt from teaching our children about God. We are all teachers. Like I said, some get trained up into higher roles, but we are all teachers. He says that these people have been taught long enough that they should be able to pass on some of the things of God to other people. And they are unable to do so because of their lack of hearing. Because of their dull understanding. And because of this, they are required to be taught over and over and over again the same basic principles. I'll read the ESV version of this again. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. The word translated into basic principles means rudimentary truth. It was used to describe the ABCs. The basics. See, we do this in all areas of learning in our life. Every place that we learn, we learn some basics and then we build on them. Can you teach someone to read who refuses to understand letters? Can you teach someone to read who rejects basic sentence structure? Math is useless without an understanding of numbers. Music uses notes and measures. I've seen Nate work with the children of our church, and there's many times I can go downstairs and hear Kaysen playing the basic chord progressions that he has been taught as he works through them. Before he can play anything else, he must learn the basics. We see it in athletics. Coaches teach the basic principles before they advanced. In every single area of our life, from cooking to knitting to be proficient at our jobs, we learn the basics and we build on them. We advance on them. We, be prof- we become proficient in one area and then we go to the next area. And we build and we build and we build. An employee who does not, or an employee who has to be taught the basics over and over and over again, how long do they last? They don't last very long. Why? Because there's an expectation for you to learn the basics and move on. An athlete who never grows, how long will they stay on the team? Not very long. The author says that you should be beyond this now. You are to a point that you are just no longer even hearing what's being taught. You are stuck in the basics. And this is not because what's being taught is hard. It's because they're hard of hearing. Who here has ever had a student that just doesn't want to learn? Maybe a child that doesn't want to learn. It's hard. But have you ever had a student or a child that struggles to to learn the alphabet or struggles to read, but they try really hard at that? That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about someone who is struggling to gain the understanding. We're talking about someone who doesn't care to understand. They have come to a place that they know it all. They're apathetic to any more information. They're complacent and content that they have what they need. I find every time I sit down and read the Word and try and study the Word for God for, to preach and to teach, I know less and less. God gets bigger and bigger. It gets deeper and deeper. But he's speaking of people who have come to the point where they're like, I'm good. They've become desensitized to the importance of the Word of God. The consequence of this is that the people he speaks of will spend much time and probably a little bit of energy But they will do the same things over and over and over again, year after year. He paints this picture of like grown men drinking from a bottle. I mean, if I was up here and got a little tickle in my throat and started to cough and I pulled up a a big one liter bottle and took a big sip off of that, would that be appropriate? 
One you'd think it's really weird, and then the next one would say, at least use a sippy cup. No, I don't know. It would not be appropriate for me to drink from a bottle, and this is basically the image that he's painting on these people. It's not a very flattering description. He says, those who fail to hear, those who stay on the milk of God's revelation, will be lacking. And in verse 13, he continues with, Now everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced with the message about righteousness because he is an infant. See, those who become dull of hearing, those that go back to the basics of milk, will find that they will be inexperienced and unskilled with the content of the message about the state of righteousness. They're unskilled. See, training has some basic parts to it that I have found are very important. That there is a process of learning, there's a process of training. One of the examples that, I, that I've always seen is like the example of a police officer. So if you, if you look at how police officers are trained, at least from the experience that I have, is it usually starts in the classroom. Something new comes out, something happens. They don't go out to the street first. They do go to a classroom. They're verbally taught something. They're exposed to new information. Information that they have never seen before, or they've never applied before. Then they get taken out to a training ground, a safe place to implement what they have been taught without consequence. That's the next thing. You start to try it out in guided training. After that, they may go on a ride-along where they'll go out with someone experienced and they will see how that information is used in the real world, in real situations, so that they get a picture of how to do the job. But the goal is for no one to ever stay in that process. The goal is for the person to be a fully trained officer that will go out in the real world and will make wise decisions on hard situations and will be a good police officer. And then those that have gone out in the real world and have gained experience, and have gained training, that they are skilled in the knowledge that they have been given, they go back and they do the verbal teaching. They go back and they do the safe environment teaching. Then they are the ones that get ride-alongs with. There is an expected progress to training this way. If you met a person that says, yes, I'm training to be an officer, and you're like, oh, that's awesome. How long have you been doing it? I've been doing it for 15 years. 15 years. What's the craziest thing you've seen on the street in 15 years? And he says, I've never been on the street. Well, what do you mean? He says, I'm still in the academy. Like, I have no desire to go out in the street. I have no desire to be in a cop car. I have zero desire to ever shoot a gun. I have zero desire to ever show up at someone's house. All I want to do is stay in the academy. Are they becoming a police officer? They're stuck in the basic truths. They have no desire to leave. They have not applied anything that they have learned. They have not gone out in the real world. They have not attempted to try it out because they are an infant. They are a baby. See, dull hearing leads to being stuck in the basics, which leads to a lack of experience. If we don't hear what's being taught, We continue to get taught the same things. And if we get taught the same things, we never go out in the real world and attempt to apply them. Which then leads to a lack of discernment. Hebrews 5.14 But solid food is for the mature, for those whose senses have been trained to distinguish between good and evil. The ESV says, but solid food is for the mature, for those that have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. In contrast to the immature, he now brings in the mature. The mature have the ability of discernment. They have the power, the ability to perceive right and wrong. 
to know God's will. Romans 12, 1 through 2. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this edge, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. The author of Hebrews is saying, if you don't start listening to the words if you don't start moving forward, if you don't start applying what's been taught, you will lack discernment. You will have the inability to distinguish good from evil. See, this ability that they talk about with the Greek here it is a trained ability. Though the Holy Spirit gives us discernment, the author is speaking of a trained person. A person who has done everything that he has said is lacking up to now. And by practice, by constant practice, they become skilled in the ability to distinguish between good and evil. See, we read these and they're not super hard to understand what the author is saying. We may sit here in our own preconceived notions and think of all the people that this applies to, but it doesn't apply to me, right? Maybe we're open to it and we realize this applies directly to me. See, one of the arguments that we will deal with through all of this is the question of whether the author is speaking to a believer or not. As we've gone through many of the warnings, the defense of the idea that the author is speaking to non-believers, the continual warnings as you stack them together. The first one talks about missing the message of salvation. The second one talks about an unbelieving heart. Those that continue on with this take these to mean that the author is looking at the old Jewish covenant. One can say that one of the main themes of Hebrews is a comparison of the old Jewish covenant with the new covenant in Christ. And that there's an old and there's a new. And so those that have come to the conclusion that they are speaking to Jewish people who have heard the message of Christ, have been excited about it, have chased after it, maybe have even tried some of it, but they have now gone back to the ABCs. They have gone back to the Old Testament teachings. See, the teachings in the Old Testament, they are shadows. They, are, they point towards Jesus, but they are unclear. Hebrews 10.1 will say later, since the law has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the reality itself of those things, it can never perfect the worshipers by the same sacrifices they continue to offer year after year. 10.14 For by one offering He has perfected forever those who are sanctified. Colossians 2.16-17 Therefore don't let anyone judge you in regard to food and drink or in the matter of a festival or new moon or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of what was to come. The substance is Christ. See, the Old Testament teachings, though are perfectly ordained by God, they are a shadow. They are incomplete in the sense that they don't share the entire revelation. It is how God spoke in the Old Testament, but as the Hebrew author says, now He speaks through Christ. So if the author is continuing to address unbelievers, he is looking back at the ABCs as the Old Testament as they are, putting, they are going back to those teachings. And they are putting their trust and faith in those teachings. And because of that, they are experiencing a lack of growth, a lack of skill, and the lack of discernment. But, we can also see how, since unbelievers are bound by sin and sinners and fleshly nature, that without the Holy Spirit, that's what they have that drives them. Their desires come from their fleshly nature. But also since Christians still have a fleshly nature, still have their own temptations and their own desires, we can see the exact same sin come into a believer's life 
which makes this difficult to discern which one he's speaking to. Both the unbeliever and the believer can easily fall into a pattern of dull listening, of going back to the basics, to fall back into this pattern. We look around at the world we have today, and does it have the ability to discern good and evil? No. It chases after evil. But closer to home, when we get into there, it would be hard to say that the church is not in an identity crisis right now. That the church is having a hard time, and when I say church, I mean professed Christianity. It is having a very difficult time discerning good and evil. What God wants. What's God's will. And the author here reveals that discernment must come from experience and from skills. And skills come from hearing and advanced teaching, which comes from an active listening, an active learning. We're not called to be slow to hear. We're called to be slow to speak. But we're to be quick to hear. We have way too many apathetic and content Christians that are not growing. Many do not have the skills to go out in the world and discern good from evil. And the unfortunate side of that is that when we choose the evil, it has consequences that directly affect our lives. It's not just because God has a big rule book. It's good for us to know what is good. Do we desire to be able to discern what God wants for us? I was thinking, if this was a seminar that promised you a better life, promised you a job promotion, that if you, your boss said, go to this place and learn about this stuff, and bring it back to your work, and you would get a job promotion, how many people would show up with notebooks? How many people would be actively listening to take that information back and teach it? Because it's got some financial value to it, some worldly value to it. We will chase, and we will go after, and we will study, and we will attack, and we will put our money and resources into college and school and all sorts of other things, and none of it is wrong. However, if we don't go after the Word of God with the same passion we go over the world, we're dull to hear. We're lacking skills. We're unable to discern what God's will is for us. Would we prioritize God's Word and His people in our lives if we were actively hearing? Not just coming to church, which I think is one of the most important things we can do. One, it's been one of the most important things in my family forever is coming around believers, around people who are not just entrenched with the world on a day-to-day basis. But then also, it's beyond that. This is getting to the point where we go home and we open our Bibles and we actively read the Word of God and seek out what it says to us. Not to go into the Word of God and try and make it justify our own thoughts and processes. We do that in small groups and we come together in community and we dig through this stuff. It's not easy. We hear with our sin. I believe that. Our preconceived notions, our fleshly nature get in the way of all sorts of things that we hear. We need to have people around us that we can openly talk about things and we can work through stuff and we can challenge ideas and that is great as long as we are pursuing discernment of what is good and evil. Constant practice, is that a description of our life? 
if someone were to come to your life, could constant practice be something that would describe your interaction with the teachings of the Bible? Through church, through small group, through self-study. See, one of the temptations that pastors have, I believe, and that was my opinion, but you can throw it out if you want, is that because we have come to a church culture with so many that are lack of hearing, who are slow to hear, that is very tempting to change the message so it is more palatable to those that are not listening. It starts to be dressed up so that it will chase after the sinful nature of man in the hopes that they may get a glimpse of truth. Maybe. If truth even comes up. I was watching one sermon where it talked about, you know, what you do with a baby, right? Baby doesn't want to eat food, out comes the airplane, right? You dress up the food or what my wife does. They won't eat vegetables, you put it in meatloaf. It's not meatloaf anymore in my opinion, but I ate a lot of vegetables when my kids were little in my meatloaf. You dress it up. You hide it. You shadow it amongst the things that they want. We have to be very, very careful that we are not attempting to seek out attractive things to our sinful nature, but we are presenting the Word of God and we wrestle with it. And we come together as families and we work on it. And when we mess up, we say, I'm sorry. And when Jesus says repent, we repent. And then we try again. And we work through it. But it will not become part of our lives until we start hearing God. We need to be part of the church, part of small groups, and reading at home. It's just that simple. Because we can become very desensitized to the things we've heard over and over and over again. So today as we come to the Lord's table, as we focus on our, 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 the, the songs we sing and the words we teach, they're all about Him. They're all about what He accomplished on the cross. His work not our work. And we come to the Lord's Supper, to the sacrament that He provided, which is why this is for believers. If you are a non-believer, if you do not have a confessed believing faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we ask you not to participate. If you have questions about that, I would love to share those with you. If you have a child who is not a professed believer, we ask that you refrain from having them come up here. It confuses them later on when you go to teach them what communion is. It's special. It's holy, holy, holy. It's something that we don't take lightly. It's a command of God. So as we come to the table today, let us pray and ask Him to show us where we are lacking? Are we slow to hear? Are we not applying what He has given us? Does His Scripture describe us? And if it does, repent. And then come to the table. After you've gathered the elements, uh, Nate and the worship team will play. After you've gathered the elements, we'll come up here and we'll take them together. So let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that, that Your Word has spoken to our hearts today, Lord. That that tension of encouragement and discernment, that we should be challenged in our walk with You. Lord, I believe none of us are exempt from the challenge that is here today. It is very easy at all levels from the newest believer to the most wise saint, to become content with what we know, to stop seeking 
your word. And we become dull in hearing. And we become ineffective as tools for your kingdom. Lord, as we come to your table today, may we humbly ask for your Holy Spirit to open our minds and hearts to areas that you would have us change. That we would see your will for our lives. Lord, may we come together in unity and in love for you and in respect for your work, the work on the cross. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.